Hey, how you doing guys? This is JP Savvy. Once again, I'm coming to you with another review and this time I'm going to review another book. It's been over eight months the last time uh, I uploaded a book review, so I'm very glad that I'm able to do this again. This, uh, this recently came out for sale uh, around December probably, around November. Uh, and I'm definitely excited about it because, uh, you know, I, growing up and uh, back in the 80s, actually, uh, I was, uh, uh, as a child, I was a fan of uh, the He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. Uh, I think many kids of my generation, uh, many boys of my generation, even girls of my generation, uh, were really in love with this toy line that, that really defined uh, pretty much a generation, defined uh, a time, uh, it defined uh, the pop culture during those years and up to this day we can see the you know the repercussions of that uh, impact that th this uh, you know beloved uh, franchise did uh, so without further ado let's just get into the review and as you can see uh, the book is, is very well done I, I like it it's a hardcover book that's one of the reasons I got it because I love hardcover books uh, it's definitely it's a beautiful art as you can see right there in, uh, as you can see and it's a very very thick book as you can see right there it says he-Man and the Masters of the Universe mini comic cole uh, comic collection and it's Dark Horse and as you can see there's an image of He-Man and actually this was created by the, the famous Bruce Timm um, uh, actually that's when he started actually uh, he started his professional work uh, with comics was uh, actually producing the mini comics for uh, He-Man and the Masters of the Universe and as you can see right there also that's Bruce Timm art and and we can see here right there the toy juggernaut masters of the universe and its subsequent action figure line feature memorable pack-in mini comics that means that they came inside the the packages of each toy that ate it in playtime for children across the world uh, featuring stories by creators Robert uh, Kirkman uh, you know from The Walking Dead and Bruce Timm Batman the animated series and many many more and as you can see Mattel DreamWorks that is the one that actually that doing uh, um, belongs to Sony and they're the ones that are working in the in the possible in the future movie but as you can see right here it's a very thick book over 1200 pages uh, it's heavy but the size is very manageable it's not really a large book per se and I'm gonna show you gonna give you a, a size comparison here I have this other book, the look size. This is the X Men uh, Mutant Genesis 2.0, and as you can see right there, it's almost it's roughly the same size of an omnibus. Another thing that I like about this book is it comes with a a bookmark, uh, and many books don't have that. And definitely, that's a good idea. That I wish uh, a lot of the Marvel omnibuses and DC omnibuses uh, had. Uh, I love the quality of it. It's a very nice quality book, and you can see the art. Uh, I think this is still Bruce Tim. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I might be wrong, or this might be um, any other, but we'll, we'll find out. I just don't remember at this point. But as you can see right there, uh, this part is the only thing you can see is kind of tied together, but it's not bad. It's, it's just uh, in the beginning, and then you can see how it start, you know, to be more, um, you know, to it's easier to to move the pages. So it's not as bad, and as you can see, all the information. One thing that I have against this book is the table of content. The way the table of content is produced, as you can see, has all the titles. It's, uh, you know, all the foreword by, by uh, Tim Kilpin. It has uh, all the pages, and it has also interviews, uh, uh, you know, in the middle of each, uh, in between, actually between um, issues, there's a few interviews and interviews with different people who were involved in the production of, of this mini comics. Although I'm a fan of having this table of contents and I'm happy to have a table of contents. I don't like the way they format it, the way it is. It's kind of hard. For example, I don't know if you can see right there. You think the old comics is an interview with Chris, Christy Martz, one of the writers, the original writers. And definitely, I just don't like the way it is presented. Uh, it's visually, when you look at it, it's hard to find the information. Uh, I like the way Marvel omnibuses do it. Uh, it as you, you open that, it's easier to see. They, hi they, hi they highlight some of the important information of the aspects or areas where you can find certain things and, or interviews. Uh, personally, I like it's kind of nice that they put the interviews in between, but it would be a, actually a much better idea to have all the interviews or everything probably prior to all the comics or at the end of the book. But we'll, we'll look into that as soon as we get to it. And here, as you, you can see, there is a foreword, that's an introduction, in this case by Tim Kelpin. Um, he's actually, um, uh, in this case now, uh, the uh, Mattel President and Chief Commercial Officer. This actually, as you can see right here, in the beginning of it, this is actually Alfredo Alca Alcala, um, Alcala, you can, whatever you want to call it. Um, 
Alfredo Al Alcalades is one of a uh, very famous, uh, in this case, Filipino artist. Uh, he started drawing back in the, in the, you know, in the, in pretty much in the, in the 40s. Uh, he's been drawing since the golden age of comics and definitely he was the first one to start this comics and in the beginning as you can see they're very simple stories i love his art this is definitely one of the best he came to united states and started doing a lot of stuff for dc in the 70s uh, he also did some stuff for marvel if i'm not mistaken but as you can see in the beginning of the story they're totally different uh they they vary from a lot of the animation stuff um he changed a lot of parts and he's a true legend in the filipino um community in the comic book Filipino community because he was one of the forefathers of the industry over there and actually a hero uh, definitely in that in that part of the world and definitely his art is very reminiscent of of you know that golden age of uh, in this case um art as you can see right there definitely fantastic uh definitely uh, an, a, a great illustrator uh, and as you can see, he did the first four issues that are covered in this, in this book. And as you can see, his art is very consistent, beautiful art. Uh, and it's definitely a, a, a hero. And actually, the one that started uh, pretty much the craze for this comics that they came in this in, inside the toys. And as you can see right there, I love it. I love the art. And I'm definitely, he did a fantastic job. This first issues were actually produced. And I'm going to go a little faster so you can see. We're produced by DC Comics. Uh, they produced the first 11 issues. And everything is after that. Mattel took care of it. But it was a real nice introduction. I really love his art. Um, you can see that. Uh, Mr. Alcala was also. A, um, he did for in the 70s. He worked with Conan. He did a lot of it. So you can see he brought that with him. Part of that style. Um, definitely fantastic. And I love it. And after he was done, uh, as you can see, there's interviews. Here's an interview of Mark Texera. He's a Puerto Rican um, uh, artist, very famous. Uh, he was the one that continued on after, you know, the first four issues when Mr. Alcala, Alcala you know, I think it was Mark Texera took over. And I love Mark Texera. Uh, some of these comics I didn't have. I have because I, I had almost a bit, all the collection of the Master Universe, so I had many of these comics. But as you know, as growing up as a child, and I, you can see I love Texera's uh, take on, on the Mass of the Universe. And there's differences in between the toy lines and, and the movie animation and the way they were designed. Because, of course, these comics came before the animation. And, of course, in the beginning of the toy lines, you know, they were done before the toy lines came for sale. Of course, they were going on deadlines. So some of the colors, some of the art is not definitely, is not as, um, as accurate compared to one another. Uh, but you know that was part of the process. Uh, definitely, there is a lot of it, and as you can see, the Terror of Triclops, a uh, fantastic, and of course, this is Mark Texera. Another great thing about I like about this books is the footnotes. You're gonna see a lot of footnotes all over the place. There's notes that tell you exactly, and it gives you a, a really rough, you know, a rough idea. Well, not a rough idea. They give you a, 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 a con. They give you the concept, the ideas. It help you to understand. Uh, what was the process and why the things were done the way they did. It's a lot of information. I really love this book. Definitely, it is just a fantastic book for the price because in reality, it was priced, it's priced at $29.99 in the United States. Uh, $39, I think, $99 in Canada, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, here you can see Gary Cohn. He was one of the first writers. Uh, definitely, he, uh, you know, I love this. I love the interview. Some of these interviews are fantastic. I can tell you one thing. When you go through all this stuff, you can see uh, the people that really. Uh, there's many interviews, and some of the people there that were really invested into these comics. They really many were young, many were starting in the industry. They needed an opportunity to present their art, and they really took it and they did fantastic stuff, as you can see right there. Ooh, this is Mark Texera, and love it. I love Mark's stuff. Stuff here, fantastic, and uh, they did fantastic stuff. But, uh, of, of course, there were uh, others that they took just as a job. It was just a simple job they were doing. And um, 
you know it was not much than that and uh definitely you can find who was really invested into it and who loved it and who to this day is doing but it's nice that each person that participated in the creation of this comic book it, it, it has an opportunity to express and i'm going to try to go a little faster because we have a lot to cover definitely as you can see one thing and actually this is going back again uh this was given to alcala he he did it again he was given another comic book to to do and i love it and as you can see the format of course these are small comic books some people are asking for bigger panels so a bigger comic book but i think that will take away from the art i think it, it really works well with this format i don't think you can enlarge it more than what it is or unless you go uh sideways i definitely love it the way they did it it, it, it maintains a sense of um of normality of familiarity you know it is familiar to the way it was but as you can see in going to it Here's another interview with Michael Halperin. He was another writer from the book. Fantastic. I love that. I love all this. It's definitely a good thing. Like I said, it would, it would be nice if they put that at the end instead of the middle. Um, it's just maybe a neat nitpick. It's not a bad thing. Um, I definitely love a lot of the stuff that was done uh, with this book. And we have to understand one thing. A lot of this in, in this book. A lot of the stuff, you know, the stuff here, the stories are very, very simple. So definitely the violence is very limited. Definitely the, the concepts are limited. The stories are all done in a few pages. Uh, definitely from the beginning to the end, the story is very, um, you know, very um, concise. Uh, Alfredo Alcala doing again, participating here. I like it. I like it. I like it. He resembles more of the uh, the toy line. By that time, the toys were already out. So, you know, they had more opportunity to really base the art on the toys instead of just creating the characters out of just uh, conceptual art um, because that's what they were doing. But as you can see right there, definitely. So they were really created for, for a chil children in mind. And here's another of the great creators of that is Larry Houston. As you can see, a penciler. You can see more Asian characters. He brought African American characters. He brought characters that were, uh, in this case, uh, um, Native American into the character. But one thing about he did good. It's not just about bringing all into the mix. He brought characters on both sides of uh, of the spectrum. He brought he brought characters that were good characters that were uh, the the you know in this case the heroes of the story. But also he brought characters from minorities that were, the, the, in this case, the villains of the story. So he, he balanced it out. And that's a good thing when you can bring that. You, not always, not all the, you know, the minorities are good. You know, not everybody that is part of a minority is a good guy in the story. Some are bad guys. And the same happens with, you know, with, you know, with Caucasian. So in reality, diversity has to be like that. Another thing about the book is, is just the art. Uh, colors. Uh, going through the interviews, you can read that they're going to tell you that they were pretty much on a budget. Here's an interview with Larry Houston. Definitely. I like Larry, uh, his approach to the to the comic book. He really loved being part of the Masters of the Universe. He definitely did. And, uh, you know, he was reflected in the way he presented the stories. Um, they were on a budget constantly. Um, definitely. They didn't have a big budget, but they have to produce stuff as fast as possible with what they have. Back in the day also, um, you know, the technique was uh, a place where people would draw the stuff, they would send it, in this case, via, I don't know, via FedEx or via uh, whatever service, via mail to someone else to do the coloring part. Well, because they weren't such a strain with the budget, they couldn't do that. So they had to recolor themselves. And as you can see, they did a fantastic job. They used their own technique, they diversified, they built their own technique to color in house. Something that was done. And the difficulty of doing this was because this comic book was so popular, was created for many, many, many different languages. So what they have to do, they have to do the art and they have to put the balloons using old techniques, you know, the, you have to use uh, transparencies on top of it to, to change the balloons. And in some languages, of course, they need bigger balloons than these balloons because of the the size, because of the language. Some languages use bigger words or larger words. These books were produced in the millions. Uh, if there is no other comic book in the world that can say that they have been produced in the millions. They were produced millions and millions of copies were produced for this toy line. So definitely it's one of the largest sellout comic books books of all times, even though it might not be recognized as such, is definitely one of the largest in the world. And like you can see, Christy Martz, she was actually one of the writers, her husband, uh, uh, passed, you know, the, passed away uh, years ago, was actually one of the artists uh, with her while she was uh, doing part of that work. So they worked together in this project. Um, but as you can see right there, 
they're just fantastic. Uh, definitely, the stories are childish, per se. They're, you know, but they're fun, you know. And the fact that I have it in this book, the fact that we're produced, and as you can see right here, I think this is actually Bruce Tim. This is the first story of Bruce Tim, as you can see. Bruce Tim was very, very, very young during those years. And, uh, of course, he was 21. He was discovered, and he started working with animation. He was rejected, in this case, by Marvel. He was rejected by DC, they thought, and they said that his art was very cartoony. And, you know, but he was picked up by, in this case, by this animation by Mattel. They said, you know, we can help us, and they saw the potential uh, for him to create art that was good in the stories. And definitely, uh, as you can see now, Bruce Tim has been such a treasure, really, for a lot of us, because he created uh, Batman. He, he worked with, after after he worked with Mattel, he went, he went to work for Warner Brothers. He worked for another filmation company, uh, the real Ghostbusters. He did a lot of, he, he really did a lot of stuff in, in his career that has to do with animation end up at the end producing some and drawing even for DC Comics. Uh, so definitely, as you can see, uh, this is a reminder that no matter what people tell you, and I can tell you this, this is a good example uh, to show people that no matter what other people say concerning you are, maybe you say, you know, you're not good at what you do, you can still prove them wrong by, by doing the things that other people don't see in you. And he did that. He proved himself uh through all that but you know he had to start somewhere and he started doing this and definitely he's one of the most beloved artists uh his art was very well known and loved it you know by many of it and this is one of the ones that bruce tim did and i love this one i definitely love he can show the potential bruce tim did, did the power of the evil horde and as you can see featuring him and skeletor love it this is bruce tim and looking at that art Looking at the colors, he produced all this, he colored this on art, he did all this on this one. Shows the potential of a guy that for many, you know, he was too cartoony, but here, that doesn't look too cartoony to me. Uh, as you can see, Bruce Tim has a very, um, he loves the art, the old de art deco, he's a fan of Jack Kirby. Uh, he brings a lot of the old stuff, the Francesca stuff, he brings that into his portfolio. It's something that he has created. And it's very reflective in his animation. It's very reflective in the way he does his art. And as you can see, love it the way he did it here. So that really shows the potential. It's one of my. This is actually my favorite art in the entire book. Is when he did it here. And here you can see more people. There's more interviews when people involved. I love the colors. Like I said, the colors that was done in house. It was very, very powerful, very bright, and very alive. Um, I think you know, as a child, you know, growing up, it was. You know, we loved it. There, uh, to the knowledge of some, they possibly there's other variants that they were created for different markets, especially the the Brazilian market that was actually producing their own stuff in house. I can interview with Lee Nordling. I can say one thing about Lee Nordling. This is the interview that I enjoy the most in the book. He was the editor of this book, and it's something that reminds me a lot about the importance of the the, the people that are involved into comics. Most of the time, we see the credit. We give credit to the writers. We give credit to, in this case, the call. In this case, the the pencilers and the inkers, and and some point, and in some some extent to the colors. But we never give credit to the people that are part of the process. Uh, you know, as editors, he was involved with, with Mattel to create, to maintain, to produce all this. And when he talks in an interview, I love his interview. The way he talks, he expresses his ideas, he fond memories of the stuff. He really gives you an insight. He was the one that discovered Bruce Tim. He's the one that gave opportunity to a lot of young artists at that time. He's the one that put all things together. And in reality, he is the father of the concept of all these comic books. He was the one making sure that everything was produced according to deadlines. And he's the one that kept everything on track and kept everything together. Here you can see Princess of Power. This is where you get 12 issues actually were created for, for She-Ra. And definitely, I love the She-Ra. Um, the comic, uh, you know, in this case, the animation. It was fantastic. It was good. It was nice. Um, but it was not the same level of He-Man. But definitely, the, 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 the intention was to reach, the, in this case, uh, the girls and females, uh, where there was a big market. You know, it's, it's very well known that women love animation. They love superhero stories. They love comic books. Uh, although... Sometimes the way comic books are, or the industry is uh, trying to appeal more to the male audience. And lately, we've seen the pop culture trying to do more, uh, you know, be fair and appeal more to females because they, they form a big number of followers of comic books. And um, definitely, Prince of Power, in this case, was one of those that back in the, in the 80s, in a toy line that was specifically directed toward girls that love He-Man. 
and, and they given something that was for them that was that was just scripted for them that was created for them but also that a lot of boys enjoy because still it's part of the story of the the you know of the universe of the masters of the universe and i love it here you can see the color is more uh you know more in this case more pa you know pastel colors more light colors or more more light you know light colors in this case and less dark colors and you can see jen mitchell one of the writers of this uh, in this case for the shira run and there's an interview so you can see there's another one of the, the books that came one of the booklets that came uh, with different fashions for Shira, of course, directing more toward, in this case, girls, uh, and then boys, of course, but love it. I love it that this is part of it. I love it that this is included in the book, that you get not just a, a sense of that, uh, of the He-Man, but you get a sense of the whole thing. Um, and here you can see there were also He-Man and the New Adventures, the toy line that came, you know, later on. That was created. The, the show was okay. Uh, the toy line was trying to, in this case, Mattel was trying to get back on track with He Man. Um, go back into make more sales. They only produced four. And actually, one of the good parts of this, um, in this case, of this one, is that this were created. Um, I forgot the name. I, I remember Errol McCarthy. That's the name, Errol McCarthy. He is the one that drew actually this one. If you know Errol McCarthy or you have an idea who Errol McCarthy was, he is actually the one that did all the art for the, in this case, for the packaging for the He-Man and the Master Universe. All the promo art that was created for the toy line, you know, that was always in part of the toy line, that was Errol McCarthy. So up to this point, he didn't do part of any of the comics, but he was invited, um, and the first, not in the first run, but he was invited to be part of the second run, and he did, uh, on these four issues, he did that, he participated, and he did the drawing. So, uh, you know, if you know Errol McCarthy, has been famous among the He-Man Master of the Universe, fan base as the most prolific artist uh, even though he didn't do the part of the mini comics except this for mini comics but he's the most prolific artist for the key man and the master of the universe now here you can see there's an interview a uh, very fun interview actually he's a it seems like he's a man of a little not many words compared to other people but definitely he makes some really funny remarks and i really enjoy that this is the art of neil adams uh, after all that was done, you know, then you have the Master of the Universe that came back, came out the toy line of, based on the, in the uh, also the, um, the animation that came back in 2002. There were toys that were produced then, um, and Neil Adams did the cover of the first one. Sadly, the toy line did not came with comics. So in order for them to really um, do something about it, they decide to make, you know, like in this case, there were the double packing toy lines where you can get two different um characters or two different toys in one package in a special packaging cap one is the only one that was actually produced and as you can see right there it is just i love it i love the art it's really based on that um definitely fantastic it was only one produced and there was another one actually that was written in this case it was created by Val Staples. Val Staples was actually the one that did that. He's actually, if I'm not mistaken, he is actually the creator of MasterOfTheUniverse.org or one of those uh, forums or uh, pages that are very famous among uh, human ma uh, Master of the Universe collectors. Uh, he he definitely was in charge of producing this. He was a fan, uh, the 2000 uh, packing comic producer. He produced that the first one. He's a very close friend. He's a very famous actually colorist. He color a a lot of art for a lot of people nowadays uh, but there was a second one and actually that was actually you can see right there written by Robert Kirkman that is a very close friend of Val they're very good friends and uh, Robert Kirkman as you know the creator of the Invincible and um, in this case the Walking Dead uh, but, but he did that this one this was never produced uh, they was never released it was never done it was produced by a package that never saw the light of day but it is very nice that at the end it was they were able to include it in this collection. It's the only place you're going to be able to find that it's in this book. And here you got Master of the Universe Classics. Uh, the new toy line that many have collected recently, a very beloved toy line. They produced a total of eight comic books for that toy line. That was it. They didn't, they didn't came with the first run, didn't came with toys, but then they came with different, they didn't came, I'm sorry, with the comics, but later on they came. They was produced by Dark Horse, uh, used in-house artists, and definitely fantastic. He, he, he is very memorable. He, he kind of has like a resemblance of the classic art, of course, with new coloring, and it's fantastic. And here's Tim Surley. Yes, you know, Surley is a, is a writer, uh, famous writer, modern writer of a lot of comic books for different publishers.
And as you can see, he's the one that was in charge of writing these books. I love this cover. Fantastic cover. I love the, actually uh, Dark Horse covers, the way they do a lot of their stuff. Only three of these comic books are here. That's the only sad part that I'm not really satisfied. Or uh, I would be nice if they had the eight of them all together here, but it didn't happen. Uh, and as you can see, but at least you had something. And that's definitely um, a good thing. And another th great thing here, you can see there's more interviews there. There is some unpublished material. And as you can see, there is some stuff that was never published. And I'm very happy that they added some of this. Um, a lot of the stuff that was never produced here is without colors. There's a comic book that was created for the original run. Love it. Love it, really. And the pencil was for Jim, uh, Jim Mitchell. That he did a lot of the drawing back in those days, too. He was another colorist. And there's an interview of Jim in this book. Here there is, in this case, a, a script for a mini comic that was, uh, of course, written for the original series, for the original run. It didn't ever saw the light of day, but it was included here to give you a story. I uh, definitely like this, the fact that they give you something like this. It's a, a bonus, an Easter egg that you will not find anywhere else. And as you can see, here is the book ends, and then you can close it. Um, definitely, I love this book. Um, I'm very happy with this purchase. Uh, definitely, I really didn't, didn't pay much money. You can find it right now. Uh, I bought it from In Stock Trades, uh, my favorite place to go and buy books. Uh, you can find them for a very good deal, very good prices there. And one thing I like, uh, I like about In Stock Trades is that the packages you receive from them are fantastic. Nobody else packaged stuff like them. Other place to find it will be Amazon. Always they have good prices. Uh, if you are a Prime subscriber, a Prime member, you can get it in two days. So definitely, it's another place. The prices are the best. Uh, but definitely, you can find it anywhere else. I saw it in uh, my local... Barnes and Nobles, and definitely the price was a little steep compared to what I could do online, so I'd rather go online and get a much better deal. Love it. Definitely, this is a fantastic book. Uh, growing up, definitely I was a fan of the Masters of the Universe. I had a big toy, uh, toy collection. I didn't have them all, but I have a lot of them. So, of course, I have the, the comic books. Being just a child in the 80s, uh, many kids didn't see much about this comic books. We didn't preserve them. And, of course, the fact that many of them were lost in time, um, over time, you know, you didn't know exactly. I don't know. I don't remember what happened to them. Probably destroy or someplace. Uh, but definitely, the fact that now they are all together here makes it a really a worth purchase. Uh, here you have 51. The 51 that were released for the original run. Of course, there might be some covers, variant covers that are missing. Uh, especially the, the Brazilian run, but definitely that's not as important. You have all this, the toys that were produced for the North American, for the most of the majority of the world, you, you, you'll find them here. The 51, you got the 12 issues that were created for Shira, the, the uh, four issues that were created for the New Adventures, the two, the one that was never uh, published for the, in this case, for the Master of the Universe in 2002, and you don't have the eight, but you have three of the eight that were produced for by Dark Horse for uh, the classics uh, toy line that came out just a few years back and they still is still there and we know that the filmation new toy line is going to come out for sale uh, starting at the end of this year so it's definitely uh, hopefully they also come with the the comic books we don't know if Mattel decides to do that but definitely as a story part of the story as, a, as a something as a treasure for those that are fans of this collection I think this is a must-have so once again thank you for um, watching this video thank you for watching my review supporting my channel Channel. please uh, don't forget to also like my Facebook page uh, or follow me also on Twitter or Instagram and uh, in anything I appreciate that you are always taking the time to to look into my videos and you know I'll see you on the next one have a good day good afternoon or have a good evening talk to you in the next one see you later my friends